Hey skiers, I'm Jeff from SkiEssentials.com. I'm Bob, how's it going? Welcome to our first 2022 ski comparison video. Uh, we also have a written comparison if you want to read about the differences between these skis. Uh, I know you guys are excited for these, Bob, we've been talking about it. We're both pretty excited about these too. Yeah, it's nice to see them all on the wall together. You know, we did our ski test and that was a lot more individual, but it's nice to get them all on the wall kind of get these similar categories together and talk about what's good and, yep. and, you know, have some fun with it. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're unfamiliar with these videos, they are more of like kind of discussion format. Yep. Um, a lot more qualitative information than quantitative information. If you want all the details on construction and turn radii and all those specs, Ski Test is a great place to start and then we often have long form reviews of these skis too where we really like dive deep into yeah. each ski's performance almost too deep maybe no such thing no such thing <laughs> um so this is pretty cool you know we've got 18 skis up here on the wall we actually have a couple extra off camera right now so if you don't see the ski that you're interested in i would venture a guess that we have it off camera um, and we have an extra feature this year. Bob brought along his trusty scale. Um, so we'll be looking at some differences in weights between these skis too, yep. which should be cool because we've never done that before. Um, so with that said, I think we can start right off. Um, and we're going in alphabetical order by brand for this video. We'll switch things up in future videos and, and do some interesting, interesting uh, mixes and, and how we organize things. But Starting off with this Armada Declivity 92 Ti, and gosh, Bob, I think this is a really good one to start with. Um, very, very versatile all-mountain performance when I think of this ski. Yep. It's got a really good mix of feeling strong and stable on a groomer, but also maneuverable and agile, perfectly appropriate in the bumps and trees, that kind of stuff. Um, they put a nice amount of tip rocker on this ski, as well as some like kind of smooth early taper that's giving it a lot of its maneuverability. Um, pretty strong flex pattern, but as we look at some other skis up here, it's certainly not the stiffest. No, but it's consistent. And yes. you know, that's kind of one of the things that I think we can get into with these skis is that they have a, a very varying degree of consistency in their stiffness. And I would put this as one of the more consistent yeah. tip to tail. Yeah, so. very even flex pattern from tip to tail. Uh, we're going to have to turn this thing on and off a bunch throughout the video, but we were pretty impressed by the weight of these skis. This 180 centimeter is coming in at 1,825 grams, um, and there are metal laminates in this ski. Yep. So one of the lightest skis on the wall with traditional metal laminates. Uh, what's different about this ski and the way that they use metal is they call it articulated tightenal banding and they've got basically like kind of fingers of metal up here or slits in the metal and that's basically allowing the ski to articulate as you enter into a turn. Right. It's letting this part of the ski twist a little bit more than the rest of the ski. So smoother turn initiation but then once you're in the turn you know you get strong Strong edge grip right underfoot, vertical sidewalls, full sheets of metal. Um, so pretty strong ski. Um, I actually own a pair of these and I kind of use it as just my directional all mountain ski. Yep. Um, for my weight, it's basically got all the power that I would need. Um, I can tell when I get on some other skis that they're stronger than this, but yeah, again, at my weight, there's not really any limitations to it. So. And you're on this 180, correct? That is correct. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it feels like a great length to me. Um, so that's the Armada Declivity 92 Ti. And then, as I mentioned, we have some skis off camera right now. And one of them we'll get right now. This is the new Declivity 88C. Um, and this is a new model for 2022 where the Declivity 92 Ti is a carryover model. And Bob, I know you skied these quite a bit this past season and you were quite impressed by them. Yeah, I always like it when they take a ski that has metal, take out the metal, and it still is super enjoyable. Yeah. And that's what this is. I mean, it takes a lot of the philosophies of that 92 Ti, um, basically removes the metal, puts in carbon stringers. 
uh, vertical, you know, vertically oriented carbon stringers. It does end up being still a pretty darn stiff ski. You can definitely feel that carbon really activating in that. Um, and when you're on it, it makes a lot of sense. So a little bit narrower, a little bit better torsional stiffness even, you know, almost, almost more than the metallic uh, version. Uh, but just a ton of energy coming out of the turn with this one. Um, what'd you get for a weight on The that? weight on this ski went down to 1,710 grams. Right, so like so. 150 grams lighter or so. Yeah, we are dropping four <clears throat> centimeters in length, but yeah. almost negligible difference in length. Um, but yeah, I mean, definitely, I, I would put myself as, you know, over 220 pounds in more of a metallic ski category, but there's just something about uh, the way that they use the carbon in this ski and the shaping of it that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, really positive camber as well, so just really excellent energy. Um, you know, this is, was one of the sleepers uh, that we found in the test, um, you know, when Armada brought it for our media day and then again for our ski test. You know, just overwhel overwhelmingly positive feedback um, on that one. Really, uh, you know, competitive in this 88, you know, 88 to 92, but like that's a true 88. Uh, so it does uh, stack up really well against some of the burlier and uh, more established skis in this category. So just really impressive stuff. Uh, great addition to that declivity lineup. Um, yeah. You know, and we see, and then we see the 108 uh, at the top end yep. uh, in terms of width. The opposite ends of the spectrum Correct. from this ski. <laughs> uh, but really, but really, just a lot of fun and extremely energetic uh, and snappy. And, th and those are th qualities that I like in a ski. Uh, in value almost more than dampness and power at speed. Yeah, super quick, super yep. playful, very agile, but still relatively strong too. Right. You can still ski it pretty aggressively on a groomer without yep. pushing it past its limits, which is, is always cool. I think it's really easy for us as consumers to kind of look at, you know, 92 Ti and then 88C and you like, in your head, you put the 88C right. into this like category of maybe not being like a advanced ski yeah. or, or whatever you want to call it but I don't think that's I don't think that's fair for that ski at all that, I think it's that was not my experience it yeah. was not my experience on it there was more than enough uh, power and stability to it and moving right along Bob we got another new ski here the Atomic Maverick 88 yeah this Ma these Maverick series skis are replacing the Vantage uh, the outgoing Vantages um, and one of the things from like, you know, the Vantage 90 Ti, this would probably be a more direct replacement for that. Um, you know, if you have kept up with us in the past, we would say these Vantages are incredibly stiff and quite light. Uh, those things have carried through to the Maverick, uh, but there are some differences as well. Yeah, still relatively stiff. Still pretty darn stiff. Uh, 16, 60 grams for this one. Very light. Um, in the 176 centimeter length. A uh, couple of differences between Vantage, uh, they've done away with the Prolite construction and gone to a more traditional uh, build, full wood core, two sheets of metal. Uh, in terms of the sidewall, they do have more of a hybrid sidewall here. So like mostly sidewall, but with some step down cap, but that cap tapers into the ski uh, and really kind of ends into a full cap in the tips and tails. Lines up well with the rocker profile. Um, and that increases the quickness of this ski. They also added the HRZN or Horizon. I can never tell. I what assume we're supposed to say Horizon. Uh, Horizon Tech tips. Um, so, you know, shaping the tip to have more surface area without increasing width adds a little dimension of flotation to this 88. Um, but overall, when you get on these things, uh, w what impressed me most was just the knife-like quality of this thing. I mean, you put it on edge, and you have completed the turn before you know it. Uh, and that's what a light and stiff ski does, is it really brings you into the turn and, and really just busts you through the turn until the end. Great energy and kick out, uh, on the tail end as well, um, and just a really nice overall ski. I think you saw Jeff flex it there, but yeah, I mean, it's... Definitely one of the stiffer skis on the wall. Um, you know, it, it does have the dampness and stability that the metal affords. Uh, not quite the freight train as, you know, some, some of our next skis coming up, but uh, definitely enough strength and power to handle some pretty aggressive skiing. Yeah, absolutely. And this, I, I feel like the Maverick 88 is a really good example of what the modern all-mountain ski is. Yep. Like I feel like this is the trend that the entire industry is kind of heading towards is 
still utilizing metal or utilizing material that gives you a similar feel like like Elan does when we get to that ski, but keeping the weight down. Yeah. Like this is, you know, looking at the declivity and talking about how that was pretty impressively lightweight while it uses metal, this is even lighter. Yeah. So it's really cool to see how these manufacturers have been able to retain metal in the ski's construction, but bring the weight down yeah. significantly. And I think this is a much more effective way of doing it than the Vantage skis. You get sure. a more supple feel, more vibration damping, just a smoother, more enjoyable skiing experience. Yeah, yeah. and I found it to be a l and less twitchy than the yes. outgoing Vantage skis. Yes, hundred percent. Kind of one of my one of my knocks against it. This is not does not feel that way. You know, it, yeah. it's a lot more kind of reliable in terms of what you put in is what you get out. Yeah. Um, and they, and like you, I think you said it really nicely with the modern all mountain ski, and they do put a lot of different stuff in there with that, you know, tapered cap, tapered sidewall, I should say, and then the horizon tech and the tip trying to make this 88 float more than its width may indicate. So yeah. a lot of those things go into this ski and, you know, having it kind of be, uh, all things to a lot of different skiers. And that's what, you know, that's what this category really is. Totally. Is, uh, you know, appealing to that, that broad range of skier for everyday skiing. These are true all mountain skis in the, the truest sense of the word, in my opinion. Uh, next ski on the wall is the Black Crows Orb. This is another carryover ski like the Declivity 92 Ti. We've had this before. We've talked about this before. What I think is cool about the Orb is this is kind of the first ski in what's now a series of skis. As far as Black Crows is willing to say they make a series exact, of skis. Exactly. This you is... get Serpo and Justice, which yeah. use very similar construction. And even the Divus on the, on the yeah, narrower yeah, side. Yeah, right, on the narrower side. Um, so 88 underfoot in this ski, and we get H-shaped metal. So that's kind of the big thing in this ski. Um, and you'll see some similar stuff as we move through these skis in where the metal is located. Um, and I think this is a cool one to start off with. So you get full width metal underfoot, basically from where one thumb is to the other. And then that metal just extends into an H. Uh, so you get it right along the edges through the fore body and the aft sections of the ski. Doesn't go all the way into the tip. Um, they do have that really cool metal construction to yeah. the tip, which I always thought was just visually really cool to look at and, and similar in the yeah, tail, the tail too. Well. Just the way that they kind of use metal to stiffen the ends of the ski and increase durability. Um, but basically what that provides is you do get a lighter ski than if it was to use full sheets of metal. It's not the lightest ski up here, but it is at least worth noting that they're taking some weight out of the ski. Right. But by putting the metal along the edges, you get a lot of precision as well. Um, pretty strong ski. This one comes in just about at 1,800 grams. Uh, and with that metal in there, it's pretty stable, pretty strong. Yeah. 21 meter turn radius in this ski, which is actually one of the bigger turn radii on this wall, uh, which means a couple things. You can make bigger arcing turns on it, and when you get a bigger turn radius, it also actually makes edge release a little easier. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of coupled, that long turn radius paired with the shape of this ski. So pretty long tip rocker there, and at least enough tail rocker. Um, combine those things and you've got a ski that's pretty agile. Yeah. So a very, very well-rounded ski, um, kind of going back to the Declivity 92 in the sense that it, it's a true all-mountain ski. You get a nice mix of stability and power on a groomer, but then free ride maneuverability when you take it off trail. Yeah. Pretty darn good mogul ski. Um, a lot of things you can do on this thing. And we can just put this uh, this K2 Mindbender uh, 90 Ti as well as the Rustler. Yeah, Rustler. There's some similarities between these. Just in terms of their H-shaped metal versus K2's uh, y. Titanal Y-beam. So K2, instead of the H on the end, puts uh, a straight that, that and tail of the Y in there. But uh, mid-body forward, these two very have very similar. similar constructions in terms of their metal application. So I like pointing that stuff out. Yeah, and the differences in construction in the tail on those skis basically just means that you're getting a little bit more oomph yep. out of the tail of this ski. Yep. A little bit stronger performance out of the tail of the orb. Um, so... You know, kind of depending on skiing style, whether that's a benefit to you or not. Right. It's really whether, wh how you're finishing your turn, whether you want kind of a stiffer tail that'll hang on, 
or something that's a little looser. Yeah. Um, but yeah, great ski. Um, and we'll have the Serpo in another comparison, uh, which really impressed a lot of us and has a lot of similar characteristics to yeah. the Orb. Yep. Yeah, and just a nice, you know, again, as they're not saying it's a series, like an Enforcer <laughs> series, um, they are incorporating a lot of the same shaping and construction techniques into uh, some of their varying skis. So it's, you know, I don't know if nice to see, but it's interesting to observe. <laughs> Abs yeah, absolutely. And I think it, it's worth noting with a brand like Black Rose that traditionally has made very different skis, as, as those skis right. do have at least similar characteristics, which I think is cool. Uh, next, we got a Brahma 88. This is a mainstay, uh, another carryover uh, ski here from 2021. Um, this is the 183, so it's going to tip the scales a little bit more, 2182 grams. Um, so it would be a little bit less for the 177, I believe, is the next size down. I believe you're right. Um, you know, with their with the change in this last year, they moved to their True Blend uh, core construction, which is just a mix of stringers in the in the wood core, um, and it per length they're able to vary uh, the length of those stringers. Uh, so you do get a different feel per length. Um, one of the interesting thing I noticed about this ski was that in this 183, this felt a lot more comfortable to me than the 189, which I would kind of naturally gravitate to given my size. Uh, but I was way more impressed with the, uh, you know, the performance of this in the shorter length uh, in this size here. Um, you know, I kind of have a mental block against going on a ski below 185, but this definitely changed my mind. Um, you know, and nothing that we could say hasn't already been said, this is, I would say the fastest ski on the wall. Yeah, um, there's like maybe one down there that, yeah. that would that would compete against it. Yeah. But yeah, strongest, stiffest, fastest, heaviest. Yep, two full sheets of metal, even a even a third underfoot really gives this thing a nice, strong, even flex all the way throughout. Um, you know, you can even feel that it's even the shovel though, it's not quite as stiff as when we get to something like this Ranger 92 Ti, um, but the consistency from tip to tail of this is, yeah. uh, is about as, as rugged as it gets. Um, but yeah, we, you know, if you are that type of skier that's 50 miles an hour or over, uh, this, is, this is the way to go. Um, just a really nice entry to the turn, strong, confident finish. Um, I didn't get a turn radius on this one, but it's a little Seven, 17. 17. 17.5 17 yeah so it's for me to be on a ski like this in a 17.5 meter radius I definitely felt the roundness of the turn yep. and the ski's willingness to complete that turn which I really liked I think that's been an improvement to the Brahma yep. over the years um, True Blend kind of enhanced that too yep and I had a similar experience on the 177 and like similar situation where like on a ski like this, in my mind, I generally want a 180. Yeah. So 177, even though that's a small drop, I'm kind of like, nah, probably not gonna, probably not gonna be enough for me. <laughs> um, but it was like the total opposite of that. The 177 for me just allowed me to access the ski's performance a little more easily. Uh, comes across the fall line quicker. Yeah. You know, I don't feel like I have to put as much input as on a previous version of the Brahma still a lot of skier input. It's still a demanding ski that wants to be skied, uh, but I do think they've made it more approachable. Yeah, and I, you know, ego is a funny thing in this sport, and I think, yeah. you know, for a ski like this, it's okay to check your ego and be like, Absolutely. all right, I'm gonna size down and right. have a wonderful time. Just and the fact that you're on it in general yeah. should be enough of a, an ego boost yeah. for you. You don't have to worry about Putting yeah. yourself on the 189 to impress people in the lift line. No, but you know it is. It was funny skiing the 189 and that back to back, and the one. I mean, you really just you had to go yeah. straight until you reached a certain speed, and yeah. then start your turn. Whereas that was operable at a multitude of speeds. So. Yeah, absolutely. I haven't skied the 189 in this ski. I probably never will. Um, but I I remember testing the 187 in the previous yeah. version of the Brahma, and yeah, just like literally would go straight for like a quarter mile right and then, make yeah. a and then you can turns. make a couple turns and then you're at the bottom so yeah. <laughs> um next ski is another ski from blizzard another carryover this is the rustler nine um it's been around for a while now i mean it, it seems crazy but i remember 
when we talked about the wrestlers as a brand new addition to Blizzard's line yep. and kind of marking a, a significant product change in the industry in general, I think. Um, now they've been around for a while, and I think it's fair to say that they've become kind of a staple in the all-mountain category. Um, a little bit wider than the Brahma. I think this ski comes in at, what, 91 underfoot? It's on that ski, of course. Sorry, 94 underfoot. This is one of the longer. That's the 180. 180. Yeah. Um, so we get kind of a, a staggering in widths on this ski. So this was actually probably the widest ski up here at 94 underfoot. Um, so a little wider than the Brahma. And then the big thing on these skis is they use more tip and tail rocker, and they also use flip cord DRT. Um, I always like <laughs> DRT because it reminds me what the ski is supposed to do. DRT stands for Dynamic Release Technology. So where a ski like the Brahma has a tendency to want to stay on edge, complete its carving turn, you know, really clean, round finish, this lets you release your turn in dynamic different ways. Great. Uh, <laughs> which I think is it just a really good yeah. way to think about the ski's performance. It's allowing for a multitude of different turn shapes and styles. Now we still get this metal laminate underfoot. So in this portion of the ski, full width metal, a uh, very, very strong feel, and there's good camber in this ski as well. So there are certainly some similarities between this ski and the Brahma, especially if you focus on right under your foot. And then as you reach the tip and tail, the metal kind of goes into the middle of the ski like we were talking about with the mind bender, very similar to the tail of the mind bender, except this does it in the tip and the tail. That metal then ends, and that's essentially where the rocker begins. So, a really well rounded nature of this ski. Um, I think it's important to note that it's still on the heavier side. This one's almost tipping the scales at 2,000 grams. Um, so, you know, heavier than like the first three skis we looked at. Um, and I think that's, again, a, it's another good thing to remember about the Rustlers, is they're, they're pretty strong skis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's easy for people to look at this shape and in their mind kind of put it into a similar category as, say, a Ripstick 88 or a QST 92 or something like that. Um, but there's more, more strength and stability to this ski than you might expect. It's, it's still a blizzard. Yeah. I think that's, like, that's a good way to describe it. Blizzard skis have a certain level of power and precision to them. The Rustler 9 definitely still has that, especially among the Rustler series. You know, as they get wider, the rocker is extended, the metal is shortened. This 9, still a pretty darn precise ski. Um, but you get the the versatility of this shape. So a lot easier in the trees. Um, you see a lot of these at Stowe, and there's really no wonder why. Yeah. Because you can ski, yeah. you can ski firm, firm groomers on them, and then you can go kind of bop around and play in the trees. They're not quite as light and as quick as some skis, but again, it still has more more versatility to it than the Brahma. And you know, I I would I would like to see. I don't know what they've got going on for for the next year even, but, you know, incorporating different lengths, you know, these break on the 8th, so it's 180 to a 188, and yeah. down to a 172 below this. So it is kind of a bigger break, and that's what they did with the True Blend, with the with the Brahma and the yeah, Bonafide, was, bring those differences in. yeah, they tighten those, those sizes up, so I think that they, you know, might even hit a, a bunch more skiers, I mean, not like they have any shortage, but um, that having those more size options would be a good thing. Um, because there are a lot of skiers that do get caught between 180 and 188. Yeah, and 172 to 180 too. Correct. Like that's yep. that, that's catching a lot of people. You know, I I I would struggle to want to ski a 172. I mean, I think 180 for me is is the perfect length. But yep. if I was a little bit smaller or a little bit less aggressive, I would have a hard time kind of going 172 yep. or 180. So yeah, I agree. It'd be cool to see them kind of shrink those sizes a little bit. Um, but yeah, great ski. Yeah, they've done nothing wrong with the Blizzard series, no. with the Rus Rustler series. I'm Abs sorry. Yeah, like, no, they're, they're great. Yeah, they're just very good. You know, just a ton of you know big range, wide range of. Yeah. You know, if you don't know what ski to get and you're looking for something in that low to mid 90s range, right? Uh, hard, hard, to hard go to go wrong. Go wrong. Yeah. yeah.
Okay, next ski on the wall. This is a pretty unique one. Uh, this is the DPS Pagoda Piste 90 RP. Another carryover, actually. We do have some new skis from DPS, but none of the new skis kind of fall into this width range. Right. Um, and a unique ski. Uh, you know, DPS definitely has their own type of thing carved out for them. Um, and, you know, part of that is their ability to get a ton of performance out of their use of carbon. So these Pagoda skis and Pagoda P skis have a mix of a wood core and then two sheets of carbon top and bottom. Uh, this 90 here is 1838 grams. So they do still have some weight to them, but the amount of energy and stability that these are able to generate through those carbon laminates really puts them in a different category. Uh, it also in increases the price. So we kind of have a couple of premium models here. Uh, this is certainly one of them. Um, you know, and we do deal with that price question quite a bit. Um, you know, ideally, you, you know, you're going to want to save some money buying a pair of skis, but at the same time, uh, this aerospace carbon that they use does not degrade. It, right. it stays the same on day one as it does day 400. Right. So, you know, there's an argument for having uh, a, a high quality pair of skis like this, um, is that that carbon just lasts forever. There's a reason why it's used in aerospace and, you know, wings of fighter jets and stuff like that. It's because it's just a really unique material. And t turns out durability in a fighter jet wing is more important right. than a pair of skis. I would, I would agree. <laughs> Uh, but that wood core in these Pagoda P skis definitely adds to that stability and, and, and power as well. Um, we're going to see that nice stiff flex as those two sheets of carbon are going to line up and do that. Um, the RP shaping uh, in this 90 really sets it apart uh, from the rest of the skis on this wall here. Um, RP uh, stands for Resort Powder in their, in their marketing category, uh, catalogs, I'm sorry. And so what they're doing is that they're creating a 15 meter turn radius and uh, adjusting the rocker and the taper uh, shape accordingly to do so. So when you think about DPS, you're thinking about kind of these banana shaped skis and that's where this comes from here. Yeah. So I'll just kind of put these two together. Um, you know, you get that really kind of burly camber underfoot here, uh, that, nice, that nice distance there and just a nice amount of snap in there and then if you decamber it we really start to see that rocker profile drop and start very low on the ski and then it does similar things in the tail a bit long uh, longer and lower of a profile back in the tail it's, it's almost difficult to <laughs> decamber yeah, these and squeeze you have them that together. much camber it is so that rocker starts about down here so that really um, makes that side cut more centralized and we see that in the taper shape as well where this really early early taper uh, comes up and allows the ski to float and plow through the snow um, better than you know other skis on this wall and that's where that resort powder uh, instance comes in uh, at this width uh, it's a very quick ski it's Incredibly. a really quick turner yep. um, you know and that can be both a positive and a negative depending on your style uh, someone like myself I'm a little bit oversized for this ski. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Um, I prefer that I, I like the Pagoda Piste and the Pagoda Skis and the wider versions. There's just more material for someone like myself to stand on. Uh, you know, it's not quite as wanting to turn. Yep. Um, but there are a whole lot of skiers out there who really enjoy that short turning property and the ease of turning on this thing uh, due to that early taper and that camber. Uh, make this one of the quicker turners, you know, on the wall and in the, and you know, for a, for a ski like this in the, yeah, in the market in general. So and I think it's a benefit to a lot of skiers. Yep. You know, I, I think there's a, a wide range of skiers that can get on this and enjoy it. Um, I think it'd be a really good choice for like a, even like a developing skier. Yep. Who is who's kind of working on their carves and stuff like that, but has the money to spend on a premium product. I think this is a good ski to use to take your skiing to the next level or if you're an expert skier it's just like an incredibly versatile ski that you can take right. anywhere yeah um, yeah you know I don't I don't find the same limitations as you with my weight on it you know it to, for me it, it's 
yeah, it's just in incredibly precise, incredibly responsive, yeah. and just super, super quick and yeah. agile. Yeah, and it definitely has a spot on this wall with these skis as that, you know, 88 to 92 millimeter all yeah. around ski. I mean, yep. it really, do it does it all. There's no question about that. Yep. Um, it just does it a lot quicker. Yeah. And, yeah, and I think I'm glad you brought up the aerospace carbon because that's a big thing with DPS is, is how the performance stays more consistent through the ski's yeah. lifetime and the fact that the ski's lifetime should be longer than most skis yeah. because the materials hold up a little longer. Made in the USA too. Yeah, no, that's great. DPS Factory is really cool. Um, they make some impressive skis for sure. Uh, next ski is the Dina Star M Pro 90. Um, this ski really turned some heads. Gosh, last season. Uh, yeah, the, these years are running together for me. <laughs> yeah, it's really confusing. It gets real confusing for Bob and I. Um, but when this ski was introduced, we were both really impressed by it. These skis replaced the Legend series. They have similar characteristics. There's definitely some influence from that ski to this ski's shape, I think, for yeah. sure. Um, but we found that it's just a just a better, better ski overall. Um, the construction of these skis is really cool. I think that's a fun place to start. So they use a hybrid core, which is wood and a PU polyurethane material along the edges. Um, pretty unique construction in the ski and really gives it a little bit more vibration damping than you'd get if you didn't have that PU. Very smooth feel. And then probably my favorite things about favorite thing about these skis is the Titanal rocket frame. Um, so this ski got a bunch of stuff on it coming out of the plastic. That's weird. Um, but the application of metal is really cool. You know, we've been talking about different shapes of metal since we started this. There's certainly some similarities between the Rustler and the M-Pro in the metal through the tip of the ski. So you can kind of see how it's tapering into a narrower shape as you reach the tip. What's cool about the deep, or about the Dina Star is through the tail of the ski, it's actually full width. So it's almost like if you flipped a mind bender upside down. It's almost like opposite concepts between these two skis. And I just get so excited about stuff like this. I love how they coexist. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really cool. I mean, like, the, the concepts are literally the opposite, yeah. but both skis work really, really well. So essentially, both these manufacturers are trying to control the amount of torsional stiffness in different portions of the ski. So in the Dina Star, you actually get kind of a looser ski through the forebody, which matches its shape. This tip rocker profile is slightly ridiculous yeah. you know it, it's just it's very very long tip rocker for a ski in this width range and the same is true about early taper so turn entry on this ski allows for a ton of creativity yeah. you know it's not just pulling you into a turn it's allowing you to basically like enter the turn or engage whichever part of this ski you want to um, which is cool. It, we've often referred to these skiers as, as true skiers skiers because yeah. you need to tell the ski what to do. It's not telling you what it wants to do, which, you know, can be a positive or a negative depending on how you like to ski and your ability level, etc, etc, etc. Now, getting back to that metal, it's widest through the tail, which means you get a really, really strong tail on these yeah. skis. Um, it's, it's noticeable when you ski it. I think if you went to a ski wall and hand flexed it, you might not like notice that yeah. right off the bat. But when you're skiing it, if you enter a carving turn, if you tell the ski that you want to make a carving turn, you get that high edge angle. There is so much grip and power out of the tail of these skis, um, which is really cool. I don't know if we, if we actually mentioned weight yet. Um, they're not the lightest ski at... 1,750 grams, um, but certainly not the heaviest either. Yeah. So we'll see some lighter skis as we move through here, but take this tip shape and that light weight and you do get a pretty versatile ski. You know, going back to it being a skier's ski is, I think if you're skiing moguls on it and trees and stuff like that, you need to be a pretty decent skier because you do have to kind of unweight and release the tail of the yeah. ski. It's not just going to do that on its own as some of these other skis would or, you know, as this ski would, as, as the right. Pagoda Piece 90 RP would. And there's even some similarities in the tip shapes of these skis and kind of how they 
initiate their turns, but drastic differences in how they they finish the turn. I love these in the woods and in the bumps. Yeah. Like, I am a huge fan of these and yeah. those where you have to manipulate the turn. You have to do it. Yeah. That's that's where these and then the, the 99 above uh, really, really struck a chord with me um, was how fun they were in the woods because you can... You can put it where you want to go, but then you get the response on the end. Yeah. So it's like, it, it's a nice combination of a ski where it's soft snow in the front and then firm snow in the back. Yeah. You know, right. and again, it's kind of, I wouldn't say polar opposite in terms of the, the construction, but it does have that different feel than that Mindbender 90, where it does have that opposite construction technique. But um, just a really, really nice ski. Good floater. I mean, you look at that tip shape and profile, and there's no way that that thing's getting sunk in, yeah, the, in the snow. Certainly one of the better floaters on this wall, um, even though it's kind of got that like torpedo yeah. or javelin tip shape. Uh, because of that long rocker profile, you do get a, a lot of good float out of it. I'd say there are a couple that, that surpass it in flotation. And those are like the next two skis we're gonna look at, uh, and maybe maybe the QST down in the end too. But yeah, for its width and its versatility, it's got got good float to yeah. it. Yeah, it's smooth, smooth in the soft snow for sure. Very smooth. Uh, Elan Ripstick 88. Uh, this is another carryover from last year. Uh, I think it's the lightest ski on the wall. 1580, 1580. It's, it's jumping it's a around a little bit, but. Uh, sub 1600 grams in this 180 here. Uh, we have uh, mentioned a few times, definitely in our questions, that these do measure a little bit short, uh, about one and a half centimeters I found uh, through pulling the tape along the ski. Uh, so keep that in mind that this 180 is not quite uh, the same as another 180. Um, and you know, I prefer the longer size in these for sure, mostly due to the due to the flex. We talked about consistency in flex. Uh, this one has definitely a softer flex in the shovel, and then stiffer underfoot and through the tail. Uh, vapor tip in the in the shovel is mostly the culprit there, where they remove the wood core and and replace it with their vapor tip uh, inserts. And that just makes it easier to initiate the turn and engage into a car. Uh, tube light wood core, this is where Elan really separates itself from the rest. Uh, they have two carbon tubes that run uh, embedded into the core throughout, uh, throughout the ski. Uh, those tubes are three-dimensional and they are incorporated under pressure. So you get a ton of energy. Uh, having that 360 degree flex yeah. of that tube uh, is something that you can feel in this ski. There's no way this ski, this light, and that flexible in the tip should carve and get the energy it gets and be as fun and playful, but it is. It's and that's, it's 100% due to the way that they incorporate those carbon tubes into the ski. Yep. Um, so, Very unique to Elan. Yep. Um, and then since they make these skis in an asymmetrical fashion, they're able to take more liberties with the construction. So carbon line technology is incorporated, incorporated here as well. So along the inside edge, uh, there's an extra sheet of carbon uh, just on that inside half of the ski. So that's, as you can imagine, is going to make that inside uh, stiffer and more responsive and more precise, leaving the outer portion of the ski uh, more playful and able to, you know, init uh, not initiate but not grab um, the, the the snow better. So it's a, a very smooth, when you get, you know, left foot, right foot turn on these things, yeah. there's like no lag in the, in the transition. It and is, extremely intuitive, too. It's extremely intuitive, you know, to super go smooth. Back to this ski where you have to kind of tell yeah. that ski what to do, this maybe doesn't tell you what it wants to do, but it gives you some nice suggestions. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go over here. Let's go over here. And it does it with just such yeah. a smooth, intuitive feel. Yeah. Um, I, I definitely feel like lighter skiers uh, have more success on this. Yeah. You know, I find that I'm pushing through the tips on these, even in the 188 a little bit. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I dislike it overall. Uh, it's just a little bit too flexible for someone of my size skiing the way that I do. Um, but I definitely appreciate and understand how they're building their skis 
Um, and then in the wider and uh, the black editions of the Ripsticks 96 and 106, uh, those end up being better for someone like me. Yeah, and it, it's, it's, it's a good thing to bring up because, you know, at my weight, I don't find that same yeah. limitation. You know, they're pretty much perfect for somebody around my size. I'm not pushing it past its limits by any means. To me, it's just this extremely well-rounded all mountain ski that can carve, that can dance through moguls. Um, very, very, very well-rounded. Yeah. Great tree ski for around here if you need to make quick yeah. turns. Subsequent quick turns, this is this is a fantastic option. Yeah. No, they're, they're, they're really cool skis. Um, and there's certainly something to be said about just how Alon is building their skis right now yeah. in, you know, in contrast to really how everyone else is building their skis, right. particularly in those carbon tubes. And it's something that I would encourage people to experience. Yeah, if, definitely. If you haven't skied a new Alon, um, you might not understand what we're talking about. <laughs> and it is, it is sort of hard to communicate how unique they feel. Yeah. Um, especially like if you took a bunch of skis that use carbon, these feel different than like every other yeah. ski that uses carbon. Yeah. I think DPS falls into that too, the way that you, they use carbon, particularly the, the quality of carbon that they use. You know, you can feel a difference between that and some other skis. Uh, but yeah, the car carbon tubes are, are really cool in that Ripstick 88. And there's four of them, you know, in the in the black edition ski is the quad rod. Yeah. And I know you've, you've subtly asked Alon for a, a Ripstick 88 Black Edition, and I've seen some other people as well, so. It's a fairly popular request. It'll be interesting if, our forums. if, uh, if we get that down the road. Um, next ski is the Fisher Ranger 92 Ti. Uh, this is a carryover ski. It's been around for a few years now, yep. four, four years or so. We do get a new graphic for 2022, but the ski itself remains the same. Um, for whatever reason, this ski feels like it often gets overlooked, often surpassed for a different model. I'm not sure why, because it's an extremely good ski. Um, all of Fisher's Rangers share similar characteristics. They all have this kind of, what is it, arrow, arrow shape? Arrow shape. Arrow yeah. shape build, uh, where the top sheet is kind of con convex, a um, little rounded to to rounded finish to the ski and, and you kind of you you drew some similarities to vocal before we started filming in the sense that it's kind of their version of like 3d ridge right where you get more material in the center of the ski that allows them to kind of shed some weight along the edges of the ski um, this ski also has their carbon tip really important construction element for fisher really wouldn't be a Fisher Ranger without this carbon tip. It's one way to really easily identify them when you're out there on the hill. What's cool about this construction, and we used to have a like see-through top sheet ski where you could really see this yeah. nicely, is the carbon tip actually connects to the metal. So it basically goes carbon tip, narrows to just a center strip, connects with metal, and then that metal widens and is full width through through the ski underfoot. Yeah. Um, so. Really nice blend of materials in this ski. 92 underfoot, this nice long tip rocker as well. So that carbon nose, um, you know, like we were saying, talking about float, this is certainly one of the better floaters on the wall at 92 underfoot with that nice long tip rocker. Um, so nice shape to it. And then the blend of materials results in a relatively lightweight ski, 1700 and call it 80 grams. Um, so, maybe not light enough for alpine touring, kind of depends on you as the skier. Fisher does put a skin attachment point on the tail of this ski, which I always thought was really cool. Kind yeah. of a nod to its, its free ride potential use. Um, but, yeah, in my opinion, just a very, very well-rounded ski. Uh, not like the most powerful ski on the wall, but pretty darn strong. Um, yeah. I think that's something that often surprises people when they get on these skis is you look at the tip shape, you know, and, and sort of similar to the Dina Star and, and how you, you might look at the tip shape and think like that's not a very strong ski, but then you get on it and, and there's quite a bit of responsiveness and grip yeah. through the forebody and through the tail of the ski. Um, I also think it's a great tree ski. 
you know, it's fun on groomers, it's fun to link carving turns on, but it's pretty agile on the trees as well. Yeah. Not as quick as like a Ranger 94 FR, where they lighten the ski up a little bit more, put more tail rocker back there, but certainly a true all mountain ski. Yeah. You can take it anywhere, very versatile for a wide range of, of, of conditions and terrain. Um, we did a full review on this ski at the beginning of last ski season, um, which was really fun because there aren't very many, I don't think there are any other Ranger 92 full reviews out there. And it was really fun to put some time on it, really get a sense of its nature and its personality and, and yeah. what it can do. And it's a, it's a strong ski, yeah. really, really, really good all mountain ski. And this is one of those ones that has a little bit less of a consistent flex. Yes. Uh, this carbon, when it, when it peels up from that uh, tightenal uh, stiff under foot, there. this is, this tip is just about as stiff as it gets on this wall. Yeah. Um, and then gets a little bit more flexible, um, you know, through the forebody and, in, and into the tail. Um, but still, uh, and we see that in the other fishers. And I think this, yep. you know, getting kind of buried, um, uh, you know, by the success of those 94 FRs totally. and the 102, yeah. um, you know, it just gets a little bit buried by that. Um, but there's really no reason. You know, we field a lot of comments from people that are interested in the 94, but then they also say, I spend most of my time on trail. Right. And, and, I, and I prefer probably, stability. This is the better ski. Right. Yeah. And I'll gently nudge them to, to yeah. this, you know, if you like the, you know, if you like the concept of that 94 FR, but want a little bit better carving performance without sacrificing too much, uh, you know, free ride aspect, then this is, this is probably a good way to go. Yeah. But yeah, like you said, just something that we, you know, over the years have come to appreciate and, you know, Fisher just does a great job with that ski, you know, from tip to tail. Yeah. The QST 92 feels like another ski that often gets yep. overlooked for some, I don't know if it's the 92 waist width number, Yeah. I don't know what it is, but for some reason not very many people seem like they're excited about those skis, but they're so good. Yeah. They're both, which we'll get to the 92, uh, but yeah, they're, they're both just very good skis. Yeah, definitely. Next up we got a Headcore 87. Um, this is a revamped model for this year. Uh, you know, they didn't change everything about it, but they changed enough to uh, certainly make some notes about it. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think it's just, a, they, it's a better ski. Yeah. Just yep. objectively, the changes made it a better ski. So 1593 grams here. Uh, this is the 177. Uh, one of the big things they did change are the lengths. Uh, as we talked about with the blizzards, yep. um, having they used to have a very big, they used to have a nine centimeter break, so it went from 180 to a 189, and then down to a 171 on the other end. Yep. Uh, and I think that kept a lot of skiers out, so they tightened it up with this, so 177, 184, 191. So they're going by uh, the sevens, so it'll be a 170 below this, is, to the best of my recollection. Um, and so that tighter grouping will allow more skiers to you know, hone in on what they're, what they're looking for. Uh, the other big thing that they did was they took away the choroid in this ski. So now we have a Karuba wood core with carbon and graphene. Uh, a little bit more of a, I think, a vertical application of those carbon stringers. Uh, again, when we're talking about these cores, we have probably the highest uh, stiffness to weight ratio on the wall here. Yes. So just a really stiff flexing ski. Uh, but at that extreme lightweight, uh, consistent flex from tip to tail, uh, unlike the Elan and the, and the Ranger, which are actually kind of opposing there. Uh, but I would say this is one of the stiffest hand flexing skis here on the wall uh, from tip to tail. Which is interesting because I think a lot of people, when you think of stiffness, you correlate it to weight. Yep. But this is the lightest ski. Right. And also the stiffest. Sure. So that traditional correlation between weight and stiffness yep. is kind of going away in the, in the year 2022. Right, and I think that, you know, we see that a lot, like, even just like bike parts, you know, like, yeah. all right, you want it light, you want it stiff, then here you go, you're getting some carbon and yeah. you know, paying pay a little bit more money for money. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but just a really, you know, it, it can, the things that have stayed the same are the quickness and precision of this ski. Uh, so, you know, a lot of people will use these mostly for, especially this 87 here, uh, you know, on groomed terrain, 
Um, you know, it's a little, I find it a little stiff for moguls. It's still great for trees because it is so quick. You know, the lightness and the quickness counteract the stiffness. Yep. Uh, so, you know, it does blend into that nice tree ski. I do find it a little unnerving to drive the tips of this thing into a mogul um, just because it is so stiff. Doesn't mean it can't be done. Um, if you're going to use this for moguls, uh, your technique will probably be more of a side to side. Uh, slipping rather than an, that's what I was an aggressive just, I'm line. really glad you said that because that's exactly what I was thinking um, it's it's a weird concept yeah but I think this is a good mogul ski for somebody <laughs> who's worse at skiing moguls than you okay like you're just too good at skiing moguls where you want to drive that tip into yeah. the next mogul I don't even like to do that <laughs> really it kind of freaks me out where, like, if you're skiing slower and kind of just pivoting through the troughs, yeah. then I think yeah. this can be a good a good mogul ski. And I think that's probably the vast majority of skiers is we're maneuvering right. through the troughs rather than that kind of yeah. slam into the mogul in front of you. But anyways. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think it's very fair. And as I was saying that, I was thinking that, you know, the people that we see skiing on uh, core skis here at Stowe, you know that's that's their style. Yeah, that's their style. Yeah, and you know, and that's wonderful because they are easy to yes. put where you want. And the same is true in the woods. Yep. If you're a slower, more methodical tree skier, yeah, then I think these are fantastic. Right. If you're a like charging aggressive tree skier, they might be too twitchy. Yeah. And I think that that translates well to their on trail performance, which, you know, at this width are very torsionally stiff. Uh, as well as that longitudinal flex. And so what you're going to get is just a ton of precision out of this ski. Yep. You know, when you put this thing on edge, uh, they do get more uh, tapered and rockered as they get wider through the series. Uh, so this is definitely the, the most, you know, directional on piste oriented yep. of the cores. Flex pattern changes a little bit yep. too. The wider ones are a little softer. A little softer. <clears throat> um, but you certainly get that on trail, on piste, you know precision out of these skis so if, if you value that you want that quick lightning quick edge to edge performance uh, as well as that ability to open it up and make precise gs turns um, you know maybe not at the highest of speeds because you just can't make up stability uh, with something this yeah, light yeah. Um, once you know if you if you counteract it with the brahma right um so there's just there's no way to make up that gap there has to be something has to give uh just as that brahma doesn't make those same quick side to side turns so yep. uh that's you know that top end speed is a little bit of a limitation for this but in that uh lower to moderate range uh it's it's one of the more precise and agile skis uh with a really nice you know just a nice overall feel to it too i mean yeah they're they're pretty darn quiet for not having metal, which I'm which I'm impressed with. Yeah, they have a high quality feel. Yeah, for sure. Whether this performance works for you as a skier or not, I think everyone that can that gets on a core comes away with a feeling of yeah. like, yeah, they use premium materials in those yeah. skis. Yeah, for sure, and just a really you know really good overall choice for that skier that's uh, you know on trail most of the time wants that narrower you know on trail ski that really just holds an edge good for <laughs> how yeah. light it is um, next we have the k2 mindbender 90 ti we have two mindbenders on the wall uh, we'll probably go a little bit more in depth on this one get through the next one pretty quick um, but yeah this ski has been around what this this will be the third season for the mindbender yep. 90 ti i believe um, just over 2,000 grams, 2,030-ish grams. Um, so certainly not one of the lighter skis on the wall. Not super heavy. You know, we looked at some heavier skis back here. I believe we'll look at a few heavier skis as we continue. Um, and I think that's a good way to think about this ski. Yep. It's not, it, it, you're not really giving this ski any superlatives. It's not the fat, you know, when the bra we talked about the Brahma, we talked about it being the fastest. Yep. Um, with the Ripstick 88, we talked about it being the lightest. Uh, I don't think there are any superlatives about the Mindbender 90 Ti. If there are, it might be most versatile. Yep. And I think that's what these skis are chasing. Um, and I think they do a really, really good job of that. 
kind of going back to what you said about the Rustler 9, if you're not sure what to buy, yeah. you can get a Mindbender 90 Ti <laughs> and you're not going to be disappointed because yeah. it's a very well-rounded ski. Um, pretty cool construction elements in this ski. We've referenced it a few times as we've gone through. Titan Y-beam, so we get metal along the edges through the forebody of the ski. Full width underfoot. We also get kind of a double stacked sidewall. Um, gives the ski just a stronger feel right underfoot here. I really like how K2 does that and it's basically trickled into kind of all of their skis yeah, now or a, a, a lot of them. Yeah. Um, and then in the tail, we get that metal through the middle of the ski, so no longer along the edges. Yeah. Um, so going back to the Dina Star, kind of the opposite opposite of that ski. This is more of your traditional, or I guess uh, reverse mullet ski, right. where you're more business in the front, party in the back. So the idea behind this ski is, say you're on a groomer and you're just carving turns, you get a lot of precision from this portion of the ski. You can really like push against the sides of the ski up here in the forebody of the ski because you got that metal along the along the edge. So it gives the ski a very strong, damp feel throughout, um, and it, and it holds an edge well too. Now, when you don't want it to hold an edge well, because that metal is located through the center of the ski, it's kind of taking away some torsional stiffness through the tail. So allowing for easier release out of your turn. You know, going back to the Flipcore DRT dynamic release technology yep. in the Rustler, similar concept here in the tail of this ski, where they're allowing it for allowing easier edge release and thus easier pivoting, smearing, kind of skidding turns. Yep. Um, so that goes a long way in providing this ski's versatility. So it's got a strong, stable feel on groomers. You know, not the stiffest ski up here, but this is another one with a pretty darn even, smooth flex pattern. Um, certainly enough stability for skiing fast and aggressively on a groomer, but then you can take it into moguls and it becomes just a very versatile all-mountain ski. Yeah. Not the quickest, you know, if you were to compare it to a Ripstick 88 or a Pagoda Piece 90 RP, these skis certainly feel a lot quicker, or a Core 87, certainly a lot quicker, more responsive and lighter on your feet, so easier to just kind of quickly maneuver around. Um, but this ski still has a lot of maneuverability, it's just like a little bit slower, a little bit more deliberate, yeah. um, which isn't a bad thing, it just kind of comes along with the, the extra weight of this ski which is a benefit if you want to ski fast and aggressively. Yeah. Um, I think it tracks really well through choppy conditions. I think that's something the ski does particularly well. Um, this tip shape doesn't hook up too much. You know, it's kind of not drastic early taper up here, but enough that the ski is not like, doesn't feel like it just wants to go left yeah. and right. If you want to go straight and track through some choppy snow, it'll let you do that. Um, and yeah, just, I think it's fair to say it's one of the most well-rounded all mountain skis. Yep. Yeah, and good for, I think, you know, this this one, and we can counteract it with a C, uh, is is better for heavier skiers. You know, like I, this is one of the ones that I enjoy driving the tips into the mogul. Yeah. Because I know it's going to it's gonna flex, but it's going right. to hold. Right. Um, so that's one of those things that I really like about this ski is that nice, even, but strong flex in the shovel. Um, and a lot of these, these Mindbender TIs, this, and... The 99 even more specifically, I put into more of the Cadillac division of skis where you, yes, you do get a little bit of extra weight, but you get the smoothness and stability to go along with it. Yep. So, you know, they're not, they're not lumbering, but, you know, they do more so than some of the other skis that we've seen. Yes. Um, and then that's kind of a nice segue into the 90C, um, which, you know, is roughly the same shape and dimensions uh, they use a little bit different of a construction uh, to achieve similar properties and results as the TI. Um, they're carbon spectral braid. So instead of metal, they use a carbon spectral braid. Um, so 1590 grams. This so is a shorter length, too. Shorter so length. that's kind of emphasizing that difference in weight. But yeah, yeah much lighter in the 90s. Yeah. I mean, if we had our calculator, we could do our grams per centimeter calculation. but. Brand, grams per cubic centimeter. I know we got, we got some we got some work to do for that one. We need to build a tank to measure uh, displacement. displacement. Yep. 
Anyway, <laughs> carbon spectral braid, um, they're able to, uh, you know, adjust the, the use of carbon stringers in these skis to mimic uh, that of the Titan OY beam. So the cross hatching is uh, more consistent and thicker up front, yep. and then in the back it is more spaced out. So that gives you that stiffer uh, flex in the shovel and then more playfulness in the tail. Uh, it is one of the softer flexing skis on this wall, um, and, and that's by design. You know, they're not trying to capture this TI skier. They're trying to get someone who's a little bit lighter and a little bit mo more moderate speed of a skier yep. in, into something like this. Um, you know, I, it does top out at a 177, so that does preclude, uh, you know, a fair amount of skiers. You? Me, <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I got on the 177 and was kind of like, "Where's the Where's the 184?" And they're like, yeah. "We don't make it." And I'm like, "Okay," so, which makes sense. Yep. Yeah. I mean, your 184 Mindbender 90C skier should just get a 90 Ti. Correct. Yeah, you're going to be of that size that you're able to 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 push the metal. But yeah. Um, you know, and then you know that's an interesting conversation though to like the Armada that 88C which does come in that longer length and like, you yeah. know, I'm all about it. Um, whereas, you know, the, it's just, a, it's a different use of carbon and different application of carbon uh, that makes that armada stiffer uh, and this one just a little bit more flexible. So um, we get a lot, of, a lot of people that are interested in this ski uh, for that, for more of an off trail purpose. You yeah. know, if I love skiing in the woods, I love skiing bumps, I want something that's easier to use but still has uh, you know, good energy coming out of it, and that's I think this 90C slides really well into that into that category. Yeah, been a always been a uh, kind of a, a quiet surprise um, in our test as well. Yeah, I feel like everybody that gets on the 90C, you know, probably in their back of their mind goes into it with some expectations of limitations yeah um, but yeah the ski is is I think stronger and, and a higher performing ski than than most people think it might be right yeah and then and really nice energy for what it is yes absolutely yeah. uh, next up we got the Kessley MX 88 um, gosh to go back probably that was about an hour ago when we started this video back here, you said something like the fastest ski on the wall for the Brahma 88. And as you said that, I like to picture a bunch <laughs> of like Kessley product designers and salespeople no like squirming in their <laughs> desks and stuff. Because um, I think this is the, this is the, uh, the contender for fastest ski if it's not the Brahma 88. Uh, a little lighter, this one's just over 2,000 grams. 2030, we'll call it. Um, premium, premium build on these Kessley skis. Yeah. That ski phonics that you love. Um, it's got a, it. Even when you just listen to it, it sounds very precise. Yeah. Uh, we got a wood core in these skis. Two full sheets of metal. Uh, full sandwich construction in these skis. I always really like when you can see the metal. Yep. You know, sometimes manufacturers list metal in their catalog, and then I go to look for it, and you can't see it. And I'm always kind of like, eh. Seeing's believing. I don't <laughs> see it in there. Um, this ski, that metal, both sheets extends right to the edge of the ski, just pushed or sandwiched right together with the, with the sidewall material. Um, and it's predominantly camber as well. You know, in fact, I, to me, it's fair to call it full camber. It does have a little bit of rise up here when you decamber it, but realistically it's it's about as much camber as you're going to see in this category. The other thing that's certainly important to note about these skis is the tail is very squared off. Yep. Um, it's not rounded, it's not tapered, they don't put a bunch of rocker back there or anything. Um, so certainly a preference to complete a carving turn. Yep. Going back to that conversation we had between the Brahma 88 and the Rustler 9, this ski wants to finish that carving turn, make a nice, complete, clean, round carve. The MX-88 certainly wants to do that as well. Um, I love skiing this ski. It's like, I don't know. <laughs> to me, it's about as good as it gets when it comes to this width yeah. um, and carving. 
I just love the way that this geek carves. Yeah. It feels strong, it feels stable, but it also feels responsive and kind of like energetic in a way that you might not expect from metal. Um, Kessley's kind of classic holotech design up here certainly sheds some weight in the tip, which I think helps give it that kind of slightly quicker, slightly more responsive feel than you'd get if it was just full yeah. full metal up there. I know every once in a while you like to ask Kessley if they'll build you a ski without the holotech and they look at you like you're a crazy person. Yep. Um, I don't think there are many limitations to not putting metal up here. Uh, maybe somebody your size is like the only thing, but this ski is still extremely strong. I guess my, my only point on that was I would, I would like to ski it. Not that I think that they should, <laughs> they should do it. it, that they should do it, but I would like to give it a shot. Um, as it does, you know, as this is one of the stronger carving skis on the wall, you know, like, why not just go all the way? And you make know, it just, and, and just endlessly strong? Correct. They did that, kind of. Yeah. It still had holotech in it. I'm thinking back to the MX-98 yeah. that was full camber and, like, the stiffest ski ever, and yeah. the holotech was a lot smaller, and it was, like, almost impossible to ski. Yeah. So I think that's probably why. <laughs> <laughs> but they do, now that they have the FX, they have the 86 Ti exactly. in their lineup. That's they, what I was going to bring they up. They brought the metal back into the FX um, yeah. mid-80s line, um, and that ski is going to be on uh, our mid-80s comparison. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, then to counteract that with something like this, you know, it's just a nice, it's a nice one-two punch for the mid-80s, mid to upper 80s from Kestler. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, I, I think it's like, Again, to bring up this Brahma 88, these skis have very similar characteristics. Um, I think a lot of people, this comes up in questions and comments a lot, is how do you justify the extra costs of a Kessley? Yeah. I do think it's fair to say that there is a difference in how those skis feel. Yeah. Both are premium skis. Both are extremely high-end skis. Both are extremely powerful. There's just something about the Kessleys that's it's tough to put into words, yeah. but they just feel a little different. It's that it's that kind of that handmade quality to them. And I will just reach over and grab this Rosie for a second here. Um, we'll get to this other new ski in a minute. Um, but in terms of having that on-trail carving capability, you know, we're going to see some similarities in the tail shape of these in terms of them being flattened off yep. um, and squared off and you know with this experience 86 uh, having that you know flatter tail does make that one of the more grabby and grippy skis on the back end for sure so that's a good comparison um, for, for, for this wall at least and another mainstay here we got a uh, Nordica Enforcer 88, and this ski remains unchanged. Um, we're going to see something over 2,000 grams on this one here. Um, yeah, 20, 2,070 just about, and this is the 179. Um, you know, I own a pair of these, really love them. Uh, just a super fun all-mountain ski. It has that free ride heritage of the wider enforcers. They've moved it into that this narrower bodied shape, um, you know, and really, but kept a lot of the uh, that free ride influence the same. So we do see, you know, a longer rocker profile, a little bit more spoony of a tip shape uh, than some of the other skis here. So it's for how heavy it is and how stable it is. Um, it does have that enforcer character to it that make it really fun in soft snow. Um, without sacrificing a whole lot on the hard snow too. So that nice long low tail rocker does make it possible to release the turn uh, on, you know, on the hard snow while keeping it pretty maneuverable in the soft stuff as well. So just, you know, a continuation of a really good thing. And we talked about this with, you know, the, the, the Brahma and the Rustler that um, when you have a winning formula like this, you know, full, full wood core, two sheets of metal, um, and some carbon in there as well, uh, you know, that's a good thing and you want to keep it that way. Uh, definitely one of the faster skis on the wall, um, you know, due to the rocker and the, the taper, it can operate at slower speeds, but with the weight, you know, you got you to gotta earn it. So yeah. that's kind of what I've learned uh, on my experience with these is that 
Um, I generally prefer them out on the open trails. Um, you know, I'll ski the bumps and trees when it's good and, and yeah. I'm in there, but uh, you know, it's, it's not like it's the easiest ski to manage and maintain uh, in, those, in, those tighter, in those tighter spaces. But uh, in terms of overall well-rounded stability and performance, I mean, there's not, you know, there's not much that any enforcer hasn't done so far that this one isn't gonna do as well. Yeah, no, they're great skis. Um, I don't think we've ever really talked about this before, but they kind of feels like a combination between the Brahma and the Rustler. Yeah. You know, it's not quite as precise as the Brahma. It's a little easier to ski than the Brahma too, yeah. but it's not quite as loose as the Rustler. It's somewhere in between those two skis. Um, something that I really like about the the Enforcer 88 um, is it does have one of the shorter turn radius yep. of all the skis up here. It's a 16.5 meter turn radius in this 179 centimeter length. So it comes across the fall line really easily. So it's a nice characteristic to blend with having two sheets of metal because yep. um, you get that stability, but it, it's a little bit easier or a little bit more accessible, I guess, for especially for somebody my weight. Yep. You know, it's harder for me to flex a ski. so. Having a shorter shorter turn radius like that is, is kind of cool. And I pulled out the kendo. If you want to get the Brahma over here as well, this is a real this is a, a three way comparison we see a lot. Probably the most common question. Yep. Across the board. Yeah, and as you were saying that the that the rustler is a good mix of these two. I would say that the kendo would almost slide in between these two as well. Yep. Um, and just you know having that that you know. Full metal. The kendo lacks that that middle section in the tightenal frame, um, you know, and we'll get to that in a second. But it's it's a similar overall feel, style, quality, uh, yeah. performance level, high end, low end. Uh, you know, the the kendo is a little bit lighter than the other two, um, but generally these are all very comparable skis. Yes. You know, if someone has the three of these on their list. Uh, there's not going to be a huge difference between them. You know, it's uh, it's subtle, um, but it exists. Um, but it's just it's one of those. It's it's a nice three-way comparison to point out, as it is like, you know, like we said, probably one of the most popular questions we get in our in our forums and discussions. So. Yeah, and a couple other skis work their way into that discussion too. Yep. You know, Declivity 92 has come up more often as a comparison to those skis. Um, MX-88 often comes up, Mindbender 90, you know, those skis all kind of fall into a category of all mountain skis that use metal. Yeah. Um, they, they all have some similar characteristics for sure. Um, this is a, a new ski for 2022, probably marks one of the most significant changes for a manufacturer of any ski on this wall. This is the new Rosignol Experience 86 Ti. Um, so really some fundamental changes to the ski compared to the ski it's replacing. Uh, impressively, it's 1,800 grams, so certainly on the lighter side, and we get two sheets of metal in this yep. ski. Um, so on the previous experience skis, we had line control technology, so vertical strips through the center of the ski. They've done away with that for the experience line. That is still in their race skis, so line control technology is still, still something that Rosignol uses. It's not like it was a failed technology. Right. They just decided this was better for this ski. So we get wood core, um, we get two full sheets of metal, we get drive tip solution, um, which I think is really cool. So there's kind of some fibers through the extremity of the tip and then connecting to a visco material, kind of a rubber material in this section of the ski. So it's kind of like collecting vibrations right in the tip of the ski and then dissipating them into this rubber material, yeah. which again, I just like, I get really excited about stuff like that. I just think that's really cool. Um, the shape of this ski is another big change or big departure from the previous experience skis. So. Actually, a relatively similar rocker profile if we're looking at the profile of the ski. A lot of camber under foot too, um, but a good, nice, long, smooth tip rocker to it. The difference is we don't have any early taper in this ski whatsoever. So extended side cut um, through the very end of the ski, which means you get very long effective edge. Yeah. Um, you already looked at the tail in comparison to the Kessley. But same is true in the tail. We do get rocker back here, 
but no early taper whatsoever. So the widest part of the ski is right there at the end. Um, so I think it's fair to say that it's the best experience ski that Rosignol has ever made. Um, I also think it's fair to say that it's the best carving ski in, or the best carving experience ski that Rosignol's ever made. Um, it might not be quite as versatile as the ski it's replacing, but the performance that it gains on groomers, I think, completely justifies the slight versatility they're taking away from it. And I say slight because you skied some moguls on yep. this ski and did just fine. Loved it, it, it rips <laughs> carving turns. I love the way this ski carves. It, it's one of those skis that just feels, it's like a puppy, you know? It's yeah. just like enthusiastic and just wants to carve and carve and carve and just pulls you into the next turn. It's like, no, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's do that, let's do that, let's do that. But yeah, it was impressive to watch you ski it in the bumps too. Yeah. I don't think it's as easy as the ski it's replacing for like an intermediate in the bumps, mostly because of the lack of early taper. But for an accomplished skier such as yourself, they do great. And the other nice thing is they make this in a basalt version as well. Yes. So without the metal, they add the basalt stringers, which you know does a different different thing. It retains the energy, but it's not as heavy. Yes. Um, you know, it's it's still stable and damp, just not quite the same feel. Yeah, and a, a softer flex pattern too yep. in those basalt skis. So if you're looking, if you're more in that intermediate ability range and you want a versatile all-mountain ski, I think that's probably going to be the better choice yeah. for most skiers. And this is one of those skis that came out and just wholesale approval from our testers and staff. You yep. know, it's just one of those ones that everyone's like, yep, that's it, they yep. did it, it's, did it. it's wonderful, yep. um, nothing wrong with this ski whatsoever, uh, and just, you know, hopefully we'll see, you know, that in, in increased uh, interest in these, you know, I kind of feel like it might take a year for this to catch on. In changing this ski from the 88 to the 86, you know, I don't think that they're going to lose people that see it more as an all-mountain ski and into a frontside ski. I think that uh, most people will recognize that this still has that versatility uh, that the outgoing 88 was known for. Yeah. Um, so just a little different, better carving performance. Yeah, better carving performance. And like, I just, I like the overall feel a little bit better than, than the 88. Yeah. So it's a nice, nice change for sure. Yeah. And it's always like a, a daunting task for a manufacturer like Rosignol, a very successful ski manufacturer. Yeah. They're a big player in the ski industry to take their their most popular collection of skis being the experience line and completely change them. Yeah. That's a scary thing to do. Um, but I think they did a great job with it. Yeah. So and yeah. Wholesale approval from, from anyone who skied them this year that we've talked to. So yeah. Nice to get that feedback. Yep. Mm, carryover ski here, Solomon stance 90. Um, this is one of those skis, the stance lineup that kind of came up, uh, Gosh, my years are getting all messed up. Two years ago, I yep. think we've seen. Um, so, you know, Stance 90, uh, 96, and 102 came out. They've since expanded uh, the Stance line. They got some narrower versions as well. Uh, but this came out really as a complement to the uh, QST line, uh, which we have a QST there as well. Uh, this is the more on trail, more carving, more front side oriented version. Uh, and the 90, uh, definitely represents kind of the, you know, that all mountain version. Uh, the 96, a little bit better in softer snow, but this 90 is just a really, really fun frontside performer. Um, I put it up against like the M Pro 90 in terms of, uh, you know, kind of a target market audience. They do ski a little bit differently. Yep. Um, but if someone's looking for that 90, uh, these, those two skis come to mind for sure. Uh, we got a full poplar wood core here and uh, one plus sheets of metal. Uh, you have this short 168 at 1640 grams. Um, so it's, it, it has some heft to it, um, but it really, really operates on a, on a nice level in terms of stability. Some similarities um, to the kendo too in, in, yep. in design. Yeah, and we can pull one of those out just to kind of see the frame. You know, I'd say these are two of the frame skis. Um, where they use, you know, almost that full second sheet of metal uh, with a cutout in the middle. Yeah. Um, so they put their CFX material in the middle here, 
uh, and that reduces the weight by taking the metal out. Uh, also gives it a little bit more snap and energy to it. So it's a nice, uh, they do this in the tail as well, so it's a nice uh, combination of materials and construction. Um, one of the better uh, mogul and tree skis in this, I really love the consistent Especially specs. among skis with metal. Among skis with metal, yep. just wonderful performance. Strong and stable without being overpowering. So it's uh, one of those skis that kind of hits the middle of a lot of things. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of why I brought that, uh, you know, that M Pro in there. But the Kendo, I think, works really well too, in terms of it being, you know, well-rounded, able to do a whole lot of different things. Uh, not too high end, not too low, but you know, really just checks Absolutely. a lot of boxes. And to kind of go back to your Brahma Enforcer Kendo conversation, yep. if we were to take the the Enforcer again, um, you know, if we were to go like that and just kind of, there is a progression through these skis of of on trail to to free ride, or maybe maybe it should go like that. You know, we're getting a little bit more soft snow, yep. kind of looser performance out of these while still having the, the performance benefits of metal. Yeah. Um, but I certainly think the Stance is a ski that can go in that conversation as well. Um, and, and definitely a ski that comes up in questions and comments a lot, especially in comparison to the Kendo. Uh, because just on paper, they look very yep. similar. And I think that knowing you know what Solomon did with the QST 98 this year, uh, that they are going to further distance the yeah. QST line from the stance line moving forward. Yeah. Um, I suppose we can bring the 92 in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, just to make that transition complete. Um, you know, this is a, a carryover shape. It's a different uh, top sheet, um, but it's a the same same structural ski as uh, the past few years. Yeah, so in this ski we get a wood core, we don't get any metal in this ski as opposed to the one plus sheets yeah. of metal in the stance. So the QST line, when it was first introduced, it kind of marked the introduction of their CFX material, which you referenced in the stance as well. So a blend of carbon and flax fibers, which like when it came out, we were all like, can you eat it? Can you blah, eat blah, it? <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Um, and turns out it's actually a really cool material for skis. The flax kind of quiets the, the vibrations that you yeah. can get from just a pure carbon ski. Um, you know, go back in time just a few years and manufacturers were starting to use carbon. And a lot of the skis just really weren't that good. Yeah. Um, car it took, took some years to figure out carbon. Uh, if you just put carbon in a ski and like nothing else, it can be really kind of twitchy and, and vibrate too much and just not feel great. So flax was Solomon's way of quieting that down and they did a really good job. There's now cork in the tip as well, which kind of further yeah. dampens or damps the ski. Um, and then the QST line in general certainly leans more towards the soft snow side of the spectrum, free ride performance, playful skiing. Um, and I think that's a good way to think about this ski. So a lot of camber underfoot in these skis, you know, snappy, energetic camber underfoot, but then long tip rocker and some kind of smooth early taper up there as well. So going back to talking about the Ranger 92 and these skis kind of being the best floaters on this wall, this easily is a contender yeah. for best floater on this wall. Um, that's kind of supported by its weight as well. So not the lightest ski, 1850 grams in this ski. Um, I think some people think the QSTs are lighter than they are. They're not the lightest skis on the market. Um, I think kind of the balance is they're certainly light enough to put like a, you could put a shift on here or some kind of alpine touring binding. Usually people do those with the wider models but it is you could do that with these skis. So you get, it's light enough for that. It's yeah. light enough that it feels agile and maneuverable, um, but it's still a relatively strong ski. Oh. Um, not quite as strong as, as the Ranger 92. You know, they s share pretty similar shapes. Um, not quite as strong as this ski, but you can still ski it yeah. fairly aggressively. Yeah, and you know, what we saw with the 98s was uh, an increase in rocker and taper. Uh, that hasn't carried through to this yet, but we're, yeah, getting the, the suspicion that that will. 
Um, and again, that'll distance this from the stance line and kind of make this the more even more soft snow oriented. Yeah. Um, and in terms of flotation, like since when was 92 millimeters underfoot like too narrow, too narrow. to float through snow? So right. it's like, you know, we kind of get jaded in our view of these skis and is a 92 going to be too, is it going to be wide enough to float through fresh snow? And like, right. the, the general answer is yes. You know, how often are you on a ski that you need 108 millimeters underfoot to support you for the whole day? Right. You know, like, you're going to get pretty much everything you need out of these. I wouldn't take them cat skiing, but for general public resort skiing, uh, plenty wide for most yeah. snow that you're going to encounter. Yeah, even a western skier, too. Yeah. You know, I think it's easy to have that mentality of, like, no, I live out west, so I need 106, yeah. Yeah. Um, which happens to be a QST as well, if yeah. you want the QST 106. Uh, but, yeah, the, the 92 is a very versatile ski and, and certainly can handle some softer yeah. snow. Yeah, so it's, you know, again, I would put this in the category of I don't know what ski to get. I want something in the low to mid-90s. I ski a little bit of everything. I ski a little bit of everything. I'm just, I'm confused by the amount of skis there are. Right. Uh, you know, nothing, nothing zero wrong with this QST-92. Yeah, absolutely. And just now that the stance is out, it's just, it, it, it feels like a very yeah. uh, well-rounded collection in general of yeah. Solomon skis. Yeah. You want to do this one or? Uh, I think we have a Kendo 88 still. Kendo 88. So we've had this one up a couple times. Let's put this thing on the scale here. A little bit lighter than we thought. We got about 1,900 grams, so we're sub 2,000. Um, you know, to counteract with the Brahma and the Enforcer, so. Uh, the lighter of the few. Yeah, a few hundred grams lighter than a yep. Brahma, yep. which I think might surprise some people. Yeah, and we're, you know, chalk it up to the Titanal frame, which that second sheet of metal, uh, you know, isn't that full sheet. So it's definitely uh, got a little bit more of a flex to it. Um, but, you know, one of these things is, is, is extremely metallic. You know, this is one of my pingiest sounding skis. Uh, for the knock test, but it doesn't feel that way on your feet, man. This thing feels damp, damp and solid and smooth for yeah. sure. Yeah, the Kendo's really cool. Um, something that I I always focus on when thinking about the Kendo is just kind of like the touch of freeride influence that it has. So that to me comes through mostly in the 3D radius. Um, so 30 meter radius in the tip, 17 underfoot, and 24 meters in the tail. When you put a turn radius that big into the tips and tails of the ski, it's allowing for just a smoother skiing experience. Yeah. Um, I don't even remember what ski it was when we talked about a ski wanting to hook up or its willingness to kind of do what you tell it to do. These will do what you tell it to yeah. do, um, which is cool. You know, it's it skids and smears a turn more easily than you might expect. You know, it's not like drastic rocker lines or anything like that but the way that it releases its tail edge is, is very smooth and intuitive um, but then you get a strong feeling ski if you're tipping a high edge angle and carving on yeah. it um, so pretty cool and just the how vocal has engineered different feels into this ski uh, in the same ski yeah and are we far enough away from the old kendo to not have this be a comparison anymore or does that older 90 millimeter version still apply because i feel like this is a totally different ski i mean i think it still applies but yeah it is it is a different ski yeah absolutely yeah i mean i think taking some weight out of it was huge yeah and i think that 3d radius is also huge yeah i think that you know out of everything that vocal is doing right now and they're doing a lot of really cool things 3d radius might be the best thing that they've come up with just in general yeah because it applies to like almost every single ski that they make now right and there's a lot of really good benefits to it just a multitude of different turn shapes as well as different abilities of the ski yeah. you know it's not just locked into a carve or something like that yeah so. and i felt the way about the old kendo as i do about the 189 brahma which is yeah right you got to get this so thing fast. going before you start to turn Whereas this just has a way bigger range than the outgoing, than, yep. I don't know, it's probably four years ago now, before the frame. 
um, but you know, just has a, just a much better range yep. um, and able to make lots of different shape turns as yep. opposed to that longer, straight, fast turn. Yeah, but you can still do that. Sure. It still probably yeah. would make the biggest carving turn of any ski on this yeah. wall, depending on how you're waiting, because of that 3D radius. Yeah. So, yeah, those, those just there's some characteristics to the kendo that you don't find in other skis um, that make it a very valuable, valuable ski in this category. And the fact that it's that frame is, you know, the, the top portions are independent of the rest of the ski really allows this thing to have an interesting flex pattern, too. Yeah. Um, where you do get, you know, a nice consistent and stiff flex, but if you push it, it'll bend, yep. you know, and that's something that the older, older one d didn't really do so good. Yeah, this one is specifically designed to be able to flex, right. especially right underfoot. Yeah, uh -huh. giving you that shorter radius underfoot. Yep. And, you know, I have a buddy who skis these day in, day out, and he says it feels, he skis it like a slalom ski. Right. He loves skiing in the middle and getting those short, right. you know, active turns out of it. Yep. So it can, it can, it can really do it all. Yep. Um, so that's it for skis on the actual wall. We do have a couple honorable mentions over <laughs> here that we're just going to touch base on quickly. These are unique because for whatever reason, we don't have the actual ski yet. We did in our ski test. Um, and those skis have since been sent back to a manufacturer and our actual order hasn't shown up yet. So we have some, kind of some placeholders here and we'll just talk about these pretty quickly. Um, this is the Liberty, Ev still in. Liberty Evolve 90, <laughs> which is still apparently rubber banded to its other ski. Um, this is the women's ski from last year, so literally just a placeholder, so almost don't pay attention to it. Um, Liberty has updated these skis for 2022. They now have three vertical struts of metal. Um, so Liberty did away with their V series, so no more V92 or V82 or V72. Now the Evolve series is home to their narrowest skis, and they get VMT 3.0 for 2022. Um, this shape is the same as the men's 2022 Evolve 90. Uh, very cool shape, you know, a lot of camber underfoot. And then just the tip shape is really unique to Liberty. There's not much yeah. rise out of it, yeah. um, which is like a good visual representation of how that ski feels. It just feels glued to the snow. Yeah, tip to tail. It is one of the yeah. smoothest skis that you will ski, uh, which is probably surprising to you if you're just familiar with Liberty as a brand and kind of their traditional skis. Generally they're light, relatively soft flexing, pretty snappy and energetic. Yeah. These are strong and damp and smooth. Um, I do think there's some good versatility to them. They're not like as easy to maneuver as say a ripstick, um, but similar versatility to say a Mindbender 90. Yeah, um, I think it is kind of where I'd put the the 2022 Evolve 90. Um, and, so. Yeah, and I'm a, I'm a fan of that third strut, and I liked it before, and I love it now. Yeah. Um, and I would even put it in the same category in terms of dampness and quietness as this next one, this yeah, totally. right here. Um, this is actually a, a 2020 graphic. Um, so it's undergone a few little updates since then. A um, little bit denser of a wood core for 2021. Yeah, a little stiffer tip. A little stiffer tip. And then we went from Tie Tech to Tie Tech Pro. So a little bit beefier of a metal top sheet. Um, so one of the things we talk about with the Stokely and their, and their metal top sheets is that that's the first point of contact for your binding. So each and every movement that you put into your boot really gets translated directly to the metal portion of the ski adding to that just ultimate precision uh, that these skis are, are known for. Um, so it does carry that premium price, you know, similar to the Kessley and the DPS. Um, you know, anytime you're talking about a ski that's, that retails for over $1,000, uh, there should be something about it that separates itself. Yeah. Um, the metal top sheet uh, does it for me, as does just the overall build quality. So again, like Jeff was saying with the Kessley, you know, when you look at the ski, you like to see the metal, see the, see the quality. Uh, that really carries through with, with these Stormrider 88s. Yeah, and Stormrider 88's an awesome ski too, because it has all those performance benefits of metal that we've talked about throughout this comparison, yeah. but it, the flex pattern's a little bit softer than some. 
um, yeah, which I think it, it makes it more approachable for a wider range of skiers. And it's still, it's, the 2022 version is not, you, you won't, you know, you could tell a little bit of a difference, but, yeah, you know, it's not a, they're very similar. Yeah, it's not an astronomical change. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you can you can flex it. You can you can bend it. You don't. You're not going to get ripped apart by this ski. Yeah, you know, it's 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 approachable, but it has that high end. I really enjoy that as a lighter weight skier. It allows me to kind of play yep. around with carving turn shape a little bit more easily. And yeah, the Stormrider 88 to me is one of the most rewarding skis that I skied yep. all of last year. Just a just a pure joy to yep. ski. Just incredibly easy, but still a. a premium precision oriented ski so and similar to the liberty you don't hear or feel anything yeah, just impeccable vibration damping it, it's like you're just floating over the snow but very intuitive feeling to it so you can make it have it do whatever turn you want so yeah really impressive stuff so that's it um that's our 2022 men's all mountain around 90 millimeter underfoot comparison i know it was a long one I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, we'll be back next week with probably men's 100 millimeter. Who knows? Check back in next <laughs> week uh, to find out. Let us know if you have any questions about any of the skis up here, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.